Good day, this is Scott Richter. I'm a director at large for the MTA, and welcome to the 2016 Symposium. I have the pleasure today of interviewing David Aronson. Uh, David is a, a former professor, a prop trader, a uh, quantitative research researcher, and uh, has his own firm right now uh, with another partner, Hood River Research. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the debate between is technical analysis predictive, or is it just descriptive? David, welcome. Hi, good to be here. So let, let, let's dive into this just a little bit, and then we'll get it a little bit more into your research. Um, um, there have been several practitioners here today, uh, I should say at the symposium, and some people are of the camp that technical analysis is, can be predictive, and others are that it's, it's, it's more descriptive and a reactive response. How, how do you think about that? And, and what's your, your philosophy about technical analysis? Well, if it's purely descriptive and the actions taken by technicians or the conclusions they reach have no relationship to the future at all, I would say that technical analysis doesn't have much value. It has to, it, it's not predicting in the sense of predicting like uh, the market's going to go up or down a certain percentage. Okay. But once a market analyst comes to the conclusion that we now have an uptrend, there's at least a presumption that that uptrend is going to continue long enough to make money from it. If that's not the case, there's no value. So I fall squarely in the uh, camp that there, it's, there is an implied prediction of at least continuation of the of the current trend. Although that's implicitly embedded in the in the analysis, not explicitly captured. Well it's there someplace. It's there someplace. So let's talk about let's talk about your work which is evidence based technical analysis. So describe a little bit what that means. <clears throat> it just means the same thing that an evidence-based approach means in any field. So m maybe medicine, for medicine, example? Medicine, yeah. I, I, I adopted that title for medicine, that, <clears throat> that an approach based on anecdote or prior authority or gut instinct is not as good as an approach that's based on statistical evidence. Mm -hmm. And without that, we're, uh, we're not much different than people who practice any other kind of uh, activity where there's no evidence. Okay. What type of, uh, when, when you look at um, evidence-based technical analysis, where does it have the most punch as far as uh, being able to, uh, for example, manage risk necessarily? Or to be, uh, you know, helpful on the uh, on the return side. How how do you see it, or is it a, is it a combination of both? I I know that I make a distinction <coughs> between risk and return. It's just that whatever you're doing, that there should be some empirical basis for it in in the data. That if this trend following work, does the history suggest that if you follow trends? it works better than randomly guessing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I think, based on a, a presentation I was just given here, that it does. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the data supports the idea of trend following, which is a, a central tenet of technical analysis. Let me ask you a question about um, applying the discipline. May it, I take a quick drink? Sure, absolutely. So my question has to do with um, what kind of aptitudes, this, this doesn't appear from what I've seen with your presentation today or from uh, the prior presentation by the professor that this is a, uh, necessarily a, um, an, easy, an easy discipline necessarily to apply. I, I think there's a certain, it would, it would appear to me there's a certain level of rigor that you have to have in mathematics, uh, statistical analysis, that sort of thing that everybody might not have. But, is that a well, limiting factor to this, or, or, or is, sure. it, is that just the, the, the hurdle you have to cross <coughs> to make it more relevant? Well, take the example of medicine. A, a doctor doesn't have to be a statistician to follow evidence-based medicine. But 
a data analyst or a statistician is involved in developing the evidence that the, the doctor then follows in his practice. I see. So you have to read, read or listen to the right people who say, hey, this particular method works or this one doesn't this work, doesn't. but you don't have to be that person yourself. I see, I see, okay. And do you feel that the body of evidence um, that supports these various methodologies that necessarily work or are productive is out there right now? Or is it in kind of a state of evolution? It's in a state of evolution. Uh, one of the big problems in conducting <coughs> historical research for technical analysis is we only have one body of data. And in other words, we can't conduct experiments like people in other sciences. So when you have a single body of data to look through, it prompts lots of looking and the discovery of potentially spurious correlations. So conducting historical research runs various kinds of risks that re the researchers need to be aware of and take precautions against, like data mining bias, for example. And how does data mining, just, just give us a short example of how data mining comes into play in a negative way. Well, um, there were a number of books written back in the late 90s called the Bible Codes. And what people did is they looked through the Old Testament looking for patterns. And they tried to, so many different combinations of patterns that they ultimately found things that seemed to correlate with historical events, but they only found them after the events happened. So you can be fooled into finding spurious correlations, whether it's in market data, or whether it's in the Old Testament, or any other place, if you don't, if you look without restraint and so the investigations have to be constrained in such a way that you don't find bogus correlations. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, I know you've worked with machine learning. Right. Uh, talk about uh, what you think's coming with machine learning <laughs> and big data <coughs> in technical analysis, in evidence-based technical analysis. Well, and I said this, uh, in this book about 10 years ago that to the extent that technical analysis does not modernize it will be marginalized and machine learning is just the latest and greatest way if it's used correctly to look for patterns in historical data hmm. so I think machine learning should definitely be part of what technicians do to discover useful uh, patterns that can be profitable. So I think machine learning should play a role. Uh, but there's going to be a, a very nice synergistic partnership between people and machines because machines are good at some things and people are good at some things and they're not overlapping. So there's definitely a role for the technical analyst to work with the machine. Okay, so, so uh, the robo-advisor <laughs> is going to have to have some human intervention? The robo, the robo the, uh, analyst, if you The will. robo advisors that are out there now are very simplistic asset allocation programs. They, they, there's only one that does any degree of technical analysis where there's a trend following element added to it that I'm aware of. So those robo advisors are not doing machine learning, they're just automated, low cost ways of making sure that your portfolio is well uh, diversified. Okay. David, thank you very much. Well, thank you. For the interview. Scott, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, if you have uh, an interest in uh, looking into this uh, in much more depth, uh, please get David's book. And uh, I would also suggest that if you haven't viewed some of the other videos that we have done capsulizing the 2016 symposium with our various speakers, please take a look at that. And we hope to see you at the symposium in 2017. Thanks, thank Scott. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot.